The country's divisions often go beyond disputes over policy, regularly spilling into clashes over identity and culture, and pitting friends and family against one another. Judy Woodruff explores how that came to be and what it means for our shared future in her latest installment of America at a Crossroads. Every president has encountered division of some type, much of it partisan, protests, civil unrest, um, much of it rooted in those very things Washington was concerned about. Inside the exhibit on the presidency at the National Museum of American History in Washington, curator Claire Jerry hears echoes of the divisions today in our country's past, starting with our very first president, George Washington. In his farewell address, he said he was really worried about three things for the country. He was worried about regionalism, partisanship, and foreign entanglements, and especially the partisanship issue. He was not a believer in parties that would take the lead over ideas. And one of the things he says in the address is that the unity of government made us a people, and we should be justifiably proud and committed to that. The country is more divided, certainly along partisan lines, than we've seen it. In our first story, we heard from the Pew Research Center's Carol Doherty and Jocelyn Kiley about how divided the country has become and how hostile members of both parties now are to the other side. I think one way to think about this is, is that people have internalized partisan identity maybe in a way that, that we didn't really see, say, three decades ago. I, I do think that things have broken down. I have neighbors that we, you know, we sort of wave to each other and that's the extent of our relationship now. Um, that's a feeling we've heard from our viewers too, that conversations about current events and politics have become far more divisive and personal. Those items that are in the news today, COVID, immigration, politics, abortion, and the list goes on. I'm not free to speak about any of those things because I fear the consequence of a conversation I don't feel like I can, ha can have. It's really hard because these are people I care about. These are these are people I'm close to that I that I've grown up with. I've lived in the same house with. Um, the underlying current between all of us is very tense. I would like to talk about uh, politics with my discuss politics with my friends. I would like to share ideas, exchange notes with them. But uh, unfortunately, we are at a dead end uh, where there is a wall. Decades ago, we disagreed over things like the role of government or the size of government or what we wanted the government to be doing. And with those types of divisions, we can find a compromise. Liliana Mason is a political scientist at Johns Hopkins University who draws on social psychology to try to better understand our political divisions. What we're seeing today is, is that the divide is much more about our feelings about each other. We are angry at one another. Democrats and Republicans don't trust one another. Um, we are more likely to dehumanize people in the other party. We think that they're a threat to the country. And these types of feelings are not the kind of thing we can compromise with. Mason opened her first book, Uncivil Agreement, with the story of Robber's Cave, a famous social science experiment from the 1950s, when researchers brought fifth grade boys to a summer camp outside Oklahoma City. The boys, all white, were separated into two teams, one calling itself the Rattlers, the other the Eagles. They were allowed to bond, and then, after a week, the groups were introduced to each other. And they immediately wanted to start competing. So they wanted to have baseball games, all kinds of different kinds of competitions to prove that they were the best. So they started calling each other names. Or they accused each other of cheating. They tried to sabotage each other. The competition got so intense that ultimately they had to stop the experiment because they were throwing rocks and they were becoming violent. And that experiment was used to talk about the sort of innate nature of humans to form groups, to become proud of the groups that we're in, to want our groups to be better than the people that are not in our group, and ultimately um, to compete against another group if we feel like they are, they are threatening the status of, of, of our team. Jumping ahead from George Washington's warning at our founding about the danger of political teams. It is with pride that I place before this convention for President of the United States the name of Dwight David Eisenhower. 
to the 1950s, when our political parties were far more ideological mix than today, with conservative and liberal wings in both camps. And when someone like General Dwight Eisenhower was courted by both parties to run as their standard bearer. Eventually, he chose a party, but yet was still elected with overwhelming support from the American people. And that would have been true, I think, regardless of which direction he had gone. In 1950, the American Political Science Association actually put out a report saying we need the parties to be more different because people don't know which party to vote for because they can't tell the difference between them, and so they can't make a responsible decision. And ultimately, what they suggested was the two parties should really stand for some very different policy ideas. We must not fail. Let us close the springs of racial poison. In the 1960s, the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act by Democrats helped usher in a major realignment of the parties, with many black Americans becoming Democrats, as many white Americans opposed to integration left that party. Layered on top of that broad reorganization along racial lines, the 1980s witnessed the mobilization of the socially conservative Christian right, as well as business interests aligned with Republicans. And eventually came the rise of partisan talk radio, cable TV news, the internet, and social media, exacerbating the divide along partisan lines. Ultimately, what ended up happening is that our society changed in such a way that our parties started becoming different on their own. Not based on the policy preferences, or not only based on policy preferences, but based on what Democrats and Republicans looked like, what kind of religious services they attended, what kind of cultural television shows they watched, where they lived. And so they started really uh, becoming different from each other in a social way, not just in a sort of policy way. Liliana Mason argues that this stacking of identities on top of one another into what she calls a mega identity has reinforced our basic human instinct for inclusion and exclusion, and that that helps explain the tribal politics we see today. I was a practicing Catholic for most of the years that I lived here, and I just needed to bow out completely. Um, because I don't understand where um, this sort of militancy is coming from. And in fact, um, it seems to have been created out of whole cloth in order to get people to show up at the polls, show up at events, show up at March for Life in Washington or whatever the cause may be. Everything from dating sites, right? I uh, have been single through uh, a lot of this Trump era. And the first line in the dating sites, no Trumper, no Trumper, no Trumper. I get it. But Probably you and I, and by the way, I'm not a Trumper, but you and I could probably agree upon 70% of how society works and the things we go ahead and want. Whereas before, we are Americans, we're going to make us win. And now it's going like, no, I, it, it's about this little faction of political idealism and my side is right and your side is wrong and there ain't no middle. Not that we've never had partisan animosity. The difference is that now, because of our sort of progress in terms of civil rights, not just for black Americans, but for all Americans who have previously been marginalized, including women, is that we have associated the two parties with different sides of that story. Essentially, the left is now taking the position of, we want a fully egalitarian, pluralistic, multi-ethnic democracy. We've never fully had it, but we want to make it happen. And what Trump has been saying, right, make America great again, is the definition of going back in time. And so there is this conflict between, do we want to move forward or do we want to move backward? That means that every time we have an election, and an election is basically a status competition, right? There's a winner and a loser. Rather than it's just being our party that wins or loses, now it feels like our racial group and our religious group and our cultural group is also winning or losing. So that makes the stakes feel a lot higher to us on a psychological level. We don't have a place to go together, right? That's much more of a tug of war rather than a negotiation. Back in a storage room inside the museum, among collections of presidential fine china, history that is not yet fully written yes. or understood. We're always looking for what sort of says the moment. Um, and these two slogans certainly say the moment of January 6th. Signs collected after the insurrection of January 6th when supporters of President Trump attempted to stop the transfer of power. 
Mason's most recent book predicts that our divides today over our identities and competing visions for the country's future will likely lead to more political violence, but that it's ultimately up to our leaders. People listen to leaders. We've run some experiments where we've had people read messages from Joe Biden and Donald Trump, for example, a message that tells them violence is never okay. We should never engage in violence. When people read that message, they become less approving of violence. Our leaders are able to guide their followers toward violence or away from violence. Whether or not they encourage their supporters to engage in violence is actually up to them. And our future is gonna depend on that outcome. The divisions in the country are, are definitely causing me a lot of um, anxiety and lost sleep, but I also, I am, I am, I'm a hopeful person and I'm a, I'm a solution oriented person and I'm a person who tries to take action where I can. A lot can be done organizing at the grassroots level and we need a leader, someone like uh, Martin Luther King or Gandhi. So I do think there is probably a solution or better days ahead. I just can't visualize it yet. And I'm not sure I have the roadmap or, or know anybody who has the roadmap for how to get there. Can we get better in time? God, I hope so. We better. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Judy Woodruff in Washington.